Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, one more thing that, uh, that concerns me. I know that people saw, heard, know that we had these powerful marches, demonstrations. But I came to a time of pondering that and I said, people think all we did was jump up and go march. And um, I want to tell you that one day, Dr. King pulled a chair up to my desk because I had moved to Atlanta, told my then husband, George Cotton, I would go down and, uh, and work with this Martin Luther King as we had been invited. We invited Reverend Walker Reverend, to move from Virginia, and I was now, as you heard, at Virginia State College. And, uh, and I wanted to, I thought I would go down and uh, sitting at the table where the Young Women's Parish Club and the Guilfield Baptist Church served dinner uh, after this Martin Luther King spoke at a, a gathering there in Petersburg, Virginia. And the reason Reverend Walker invited him to come to speak was uh, because we were protesting the fact that black folk couldn't use the public library. Can you imagine that? There was one day when folk that looked like me and some others of us in here, we could go into the library in a little place that looks like, looks like where they brought in storage boxes. And one day a week, I think it was on Wednesdays, that we could go into the library. Reverend Walker was head of the local NAACP and, and worked with CORE. And uh, he decided that he wanted to protest uh, that part of the American style of apartheid. And, uh, and I started working with him. I remember being in the Guilfield Baptist Church and, and having um, um, Dr. Said, said yes to Reverend Walker. Uh, you, you know, yeah, I, I'd like to start some discussions and workshops on nonviolence. And I'm embarrassed. I, I'm glad nobody, I can't even find that photograph. But I, my understanding at the time of nonviolence, of, uh, of that workshop at the church, working against the discrimination and the exclusion from the library, uh, I thought that nonviolence was just uh, not hitting somebody back. Oh, have I been on a journey since then? And that's a point I do want to make when I'll stop jumping around here in a minute, but maybe I won't. Uh, we'll, we'll see if, that, if, uh, if you're hearing uh, anything here. But there's a photograph somewhere of me with a cigarette blowing smoke in a girl's face. And this was at a nonviolence workshop in the Guilfield Baptist Church. And, uh, but because we were going to march down the street, and we did in Petersburg, Virginia, in front of the Woolworth store, because black folk could shop all over the store. Some of you are old enough to know that. But we couldn't sit at the lunch counter. Of course, I always say, uh, I don't know who wanted to eat that crappy old food at the <laughs> uh, But that was the beginning. But now I'm still very, very, very young in those days. But the closer I get to 100, uh, the more I think uh, that uh, I'm, a, I'm a lifetime student. But I remember getting to a place where I knew that I wanted to delve deeper into the teaching of this fantastic, wonderful human being uh, called uh, Mahatma Gandhi that Martin Luther King had become uh, fascinated with. Uh, you may know that Martin had been in uh, India and uh, was fascinated by this, uh, this theory, this thesis, this wonderful spirit called nonviolence. Um, if I can share anything that's meaningful for you today. I want to tell you, actually, the assignment I got when, as I said, when Mark pulled a chair up to my desk, because I went down as a White Walker's administrative person. Lots of you know, paperwork and typing and all of that. And, uh, <clears throat> but I had just finished a master's degree in special education focusing on speech therapy. And so Dr. King said, uh, and he was really interviewing me. And uh, soon after that, he asked me if I would go to the Highlander Folk School and meet a woman called Seth McClark and a man named Miles Horton and uh, get to know what their programs are. Because the state of Tennessee was trying to take the Highlander Folk School uh, from Miles Horton and the people uh, that were, all the people that were running the, the training program, program there called Citizenship Education. The state was about to take that because Miles Horton, a uh, white guy, who was uh, the founder, became fascinated with the concept of folk schools. Uh, Miles Horton um, was ready to have someone else take over uh, the running of the program there called Citizenship Education. And it was really just
just beginning. And uh, we, FCLC, to jump over some of the parts of the story here, uh, FCLC inherited that program, the Citizenship Education Program, and we expanded it all over the southern and border states. I want to tell you a little bit about that program because it was Citizenship Education. Now, what was that about? I ended up visiting the uh, Highlander Folk School and uh, came back really excited because I met a woman named Septima Clark who had been fired from the school system in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, when I came back to the office, by that time, the transition had been made. We at SCLC had inherited this beginning of this program there at the Highlander Folk School. They were doing a wonderful uh, teaching. The reason I want to tell you about the Citizenship Education Program is because it really is basic to what we did in SLC, working with Dr. King as uh, the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. But another thing I want to emphasize here is that, um, and I know a line I want to read for you. Uh, I'm on a program here, the Martin Luther King Jr., a birthday celebration uh, recently, and there's a biographical stuff. You heard some of that. I was on this program. But the back is, I uh, guess, I was on a program with uh, Barack Obama. Uh, and uh, but guess what Barack Obama says here? He says, uh, he, he used a phrase that made me know, and I'm a supporter, and this is not a political rally, but I'm a supporter, <laughs> I'm a supporter. And uh, I even got a Christmas card. Anybody else got a Christmas card? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had that picture of that dog, Bo, on the cover. <laughs> I tell my friends, see my buddies up there, they might not say it. He probably never saw that card. <laughs> um, but, but, but because President Obama said, as uh, many people do, um, he used the phrase, Dr. King's movement. Is that serious? <laughs> Dr. King, <laughs> Dr. King's movement. I want you to think about that, because if I make no other point today, I want to say, well, I love Dr. King, and we all did, but it was not Dr. King's movement. Now, the reason I need to say that is when we claim it as Dr. King's movement, we make other people think we have to have some great individual fall out of the sky or, some, or come from somewhere uh, and, uh, and be another Dr. King. I resist that. I resist it because I am struggling against disempowering other people because they can't be Martin Luther King. They don't need to be Martin Luther King. He did not start the civil rights movement. I'll tell you what he did do. Don't take that as a negative. He didn't tell Rosa Parks or Fannie Lou Hamer to fight for the right of black folks to register to vote up there in the Delta, Mississippi. He didn't tell them. He didn't tell James. But James Meredith is not on our team necessarily, but I heard people say when James Meredith decided he was going to have a walk against fear in uh, Mississippi, and, uh, and, and that's stupid. That's a crazy thing to do. And, but James Meredith, all by himself, started walking, having a march against fear in Mississippi. And yes, they shot him, and uh, I burst into tears when they, I was sent a copy of his book, and I think it's on the first two or three pages. He talks about the shooting, and he was uh, laying there on the ground saying, is nobody going to help me? Well, we did, because we were in a, an executive staff meeting in SCLC, but Martin closed down that executive staff meeting and most of us around that executive table headed to Mississippi to join, to follow what he started. Now, I tell you that because I think that's what's missing today. And I say to the students and older people as well, if you see something that's not working right, you may, you may not think you can do anything about it, but sometimes you may have to start an action all by yourself. And when you start that action, again, Fannie Lou Hamer knew something was wrong that black folk couldn't vote in the Delta of Mississippi. And she lived on Mr. Marlowe's plantation. And uh, she, Pat, she called her husband, uh, took her to the next county because they had been threatened if she didn't stop that foolishness trying to get black folk involved politically. And uh, one day she called Pat and said, I want you to come and get me and bring me back home. And she kept on doing what she was doing. Go back again now to our inheriting the training program. We would look at places where uh, protest activity, protest work was going on, 
And we, when I accepted Dr. King's offer to become the education director for SCLC, and my main job was to expand the citizenship education program. And I could really summarize uh, that program by just sharing that. What we need to do, oh, nice quote from Dr. King. I'll paraphrase a little bit. He said, uh, it's a terrible thing when a country, when a society, so structures itself that it treats one segment of the population as though it's less than other parts of the population. And he said, he followed that with, but it's even worse when the people are, who are so treated in, inherit, uh, infuse that sense of being nobody into themselves. And this is what many older uh, African American folk had done. We had, many of us had, uh, not me, but many of us, many of us, many of folk of my generation, we live into that designation of being less than other people. We may not want to admit it, but we lived into that. And, uh, and he said, it's even worse when the people on, who, on whom that is visited, that sense of being less than, it's even worse when we inherit that now. That connects directly to the citizenship education program that we inherited from the Highlander Folk School. We would go, as I said a minute ago, there were people all around the South who were taking actions. And I remember in Macon, Georgia, I could call the names of some places, but we would go there and we would say, we have a program, citizenship education. The Marshall Field Foundation has given us a budget and uh, we can bring you here and we'd bring bus loads and sometimes we'd have people from different states coming to the Dorchester Center. If you, you can read my book, you'll know what the Dorchester Center is. That's, that was our main, uh, main uh, training site. An uh, old school owned by the Congregational Church. That's how Andy Young got involved because he knew that uh, property was there in a place called McIntosh, Georgia. But we would bring 40, 50 folk there. And uh, now I'm the director of education, but guess what? We would, after visiting these places where we knew action was going on, and we would say to people, come away with us. And they would come. And we wouldn't have to go recruiting anymore on these people to people tours uh, or go just to recruit and tell people about the training program. We have a budget to pay your way. Oh, I have to tell you this. One, uh, some friends of mine in Norfolk, Virginia, invited me to have a, a meeting at their home. And uh, uh, Eunice, Eunice said to me, I'll just call her name. She said that she was a teacher, but her husband identified himself as a junk man. And he really was. He sold junk, pieces of cars and stuff from the backyard. And I made my little speech about the, we've got the citizenship education program, and Eunice Menace was her name, the teacher, wife. And, uh, uh, and Albert, the husband, he sat there very quietly. But I, they had brought together some people I wanted to hear, wanted them to hear about the citizenship education program. When I got through, this junk man said, let me tell you something, Dorothy. Now next time you go recruiting, Tell people you have the money to pay that way before you finish your speech, because they're sitting there thinking, I can't afford to go there. I learned from the junk man. <laughs> Never mind who you might learn from. If you want to go recruit and tell them first that you have a budget to pay, because they're sitting there thinking, I can't do that. I can't travel to from where I live. You may not see anything in that, but I learned something from that junk man. Anybody see anything in that? I learned something from him. Tell them first that you have a budget and they won't be dismissing your invitation to go because they already have heard you say you have a budget.